I think it's time to, to open it up to, to the audience. I'm sure there'll be, there'll be many questions. Uh, yeah. Hi, thank you for your book. Um, I have a question about redemption. Yeah. What would secular faith say about how to redeem the life of an individual who suffered greatly or done something bad, and also redeem the suffering of, of maybe past generations? I think Adorno at the yeah. end of Minima Moralia says, yeah. I want to see the world through the lens of redemption. Yeah. And then when you read Ta-Nehisi Coates, who's, yeah. who's a very secular thinker, he says, maybe I'm misreading and somebody correct me, but, but a sort of redemption for the past is something you have to give up, or the hope for that is something you have to give up. Yeah. Is, um, so, could you speak to that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so, first of all, I want to reiterate that uh, with all these terms, uh, uh, in order that I can distinguish between a religious and a secular understanding of them, you know? So there's one notion of redemption that can be redeemed, as it were, and, and that's the first one you alluded to, that there's a way in which like, taking up past injustice, past suffering, uh, which has been an integral part of many political movements, you, know, you can do that while recognizing that like, actually nothing can redeem, in one sense, this particular first personal historical suffering, but the way, and this, the way in which we redeem it in a different sense, the way we make sense of it, it's not that we deny the senselessness of those deaths and that suffering, but we take that as an injunction and as a historical memory that enjoins us to, to continue the, 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 the fight for justice, to continue the, the, the fight for emancipated social conditions, etc. And that's a way of honoring the dead in a secular sense, you know, and not being reconciled to what they went through, not being reconciled to that they're gone, but also not in the same thing that like there would be a redemption independent on how we remember them and how we go on. That's again, I mean, that's why it's such an important difference that like in secular faith we recognize that like whatever you're committed to only exists through how you sustain that commitment, through how we together practically enact and sustain those things, you know? And, and then you can have uh, one notion of redemption. It doesn't give you the sort of complete redemption, uh, the other word of the redemption that would be religious, but part of what I'm trying to show is that that wouldn't, uh, uh, that wouldn't solve the problem with just an old problem as it were. So, yeah. um, you have a long chapter on democratic socialism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been a democratic socialist uh, all my life, yeah. but unfortunately, I still don't know what it means. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I wonder if I could ask you two questions. Yeah, yeah. First, uh, will production be international, national, regional, and local? Yeah. Second, mm. at each level, will there be a plan? If so, where will the plan come from? Right. And if not, um, how will each enterprise get its production requirements and goals? Yeah. And third, finally, how will prices be determined? How will prices be determined? Right. Okay, so those are three uh, big questions. And since we haven't been talking about... And not running for president. <laughs> yes, you might be one of the 78 yeah. people. Yeah. 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 That, that, that part of the book so much, but I'll, I'll try to say a couple of things. I mean, uh, 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 one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do is show that like uh, much of what has been called democratic socialism is limited to like redistribution of wealth produced through the capitalist mode of production, uh, and, and that's what I call social democracy. And like I'm trying to show why like uh, the contradictions of value on the capitalism are irreducible as long as we don't transform that. So like what the contradiction is in our current form of life. And then I'm specifying the principles in light of which we would have to be organized to not be subject to those contradictions. You know? And those principles are neither a blueprint for all of those questions, uh, um, but they, they're also not just empty utopian slogans because they give concrete and general uh, constraints on what that form of life would have to be. So, on the, on first on the international question, uh, there would be, have to be agreement on the level of general principles, the three principles I specify, you know? But then, that can be organized in different ways. Uh, so, uh, production obviously would happen on all the levels that you specify. Uh, the second question is about the plan. Yeah, so this is, of course, like a vexed issue in the, in the history of socialism. But, but very importantly, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think that the, you know, uh, the problem of planning is irreducible to any economy. Uh, but for reasons I try to show in the book, I don't think we have to choose between 
either like a top-down central planning or the sort of supposedly organic spontaneous planning you have for the market. Uh, and third, uh, uh, there would be no prices in that sense because uh, because you change the value form. So so uh, uh, I mean this is a much longer answer, but but but, but uh, uh, yeah, if labor time is no longer a measure of value, uh, uh, yeah, the the the. the uh, the question of price is no longer operative. Okay. So that's the long, that's the long question. But the, the short answer is like, uh, uh, you know, nothing would cost anything in that sense. So there would be no price. Uh, um, there's a deeper sense in which there's a real, uh, uh, you know, there's a different sense of loss and things having a having a price. But yeah. Um, can you just say more about the? Um, I guess the more private secular practices that you have in mind and what community would look like on a kind of small scale, you know, in a private life. Um, like, I guess I'm not asking about like, the organization of the state, I'm asking about like a person's individual life and what the kind of community building looks like that you have in mind. Oh, yeah, okay, so, uh, and tell me if I missed another question, but I, I I don't have prescriptions on that level, you know. Uh, that, that would be a terrible idea, I think. Uh, uh, but but uh, it's rather like giving a different account of, uh, you know, uh, the sort of motivational structures that are at work in community building, you know, and that can, and, and can take different forms, and why uh, many of those practices where uh, we still tend to think something essential is missing if you don't have a religious framework which is specifically around birth and death and life-defining commitments why uh, they can be more fully what they are and ought to be understood in secular terms I mean that's so it's on that level like transforming the parameters for how we imagine these things I mean that's a different project than like than like blueprint people how they should do it I don't want to do that but I, but I want to transform some of the fundamental assumptions we have that like uh, uh, Martin, just to, to yeah. interrupt it, um, uh, it, but it occurred to me that, that a, a way of focusing this is, is, I mean, you do talk a little bit about um, this um, recourse that we reflexively, most of us, have to religious forms of burial, um, even when it's flagrantly, flagrantly the fact that the person being buried had no, no particular religious faith. That, I mean, that's, there is some way in which secular life has yet to evolve. Um, I mean, you mentioned, I think, in yeah. the book, sort of attending secular funerals. Yeah. Um, what do they look like? Well, okay, so uh, two things about this. Uh, the first is, is uh, that, uh, and this is one of the arguments I make in the book, that, that uh, even what we're trying to capture with the religious language around burial and mourning, you know, it's better understood in secular terms, in my sense. You know, and that's supposed to open up uh, possible to practice an imagination that would that, that allow one to be more fully yeah. justice for that. Uh, and just uh, on the more personal that, that you mentioned, I mean, I think uh, uh, I've already seen lots of examples on that where, like, uh, uh, an explicitly secular framework allows you to avow the pain of mourning and loss mm. in a way uh, that is more yeah. adequate to the papers at stake. You know, and uh, and uh, and I try to show that this is just not a recent issue. It's already an issue for for Luther when he's burying his daughter in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. That uh, he says to the congregation, "We Christians ought not to mourn. You know, we actually don't have a reason to mourn, and yet he has to find all these ways to to express that pain and pathos of, mm -hmm. of loss and mourning. And that's already grappling for a sort of secular language and a secular way of doing justice to to these experiences and to the commitments that that are implicit in them so um <laughs> yeah no, i think that's 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 that's, so that's sort of groundwork um rather than prescription um i'll take it yeah um, 
There appear to be uh, strong parallels between some of the basic themes in your book and uh, uh, Heidegger's uh, ontological analysis of Dasein, yeah. and yet Heidegger is never mentioned in the book. I wonder uh, uh, what, 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 why that, that is. Yeah, well, two, two reasons. <laughs> First, uh, I didn't want uh, Heidegger to pollute the prose in the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's one reason. Uh, and the other reason is that like, uh, I'm writing this uh, systematic philosophical book that, that tries to develop being a time, you know, I have a footnote about that. Uh, uh, and the third reason, I guess, is that like Heidegger's name is so overdetermined, and there's so much about Heidegger's era as a whole that I have no sympathy for, uh, uh, including his diagnosis of modernity uh, and uh, everything starting from the 30s, basically. So, so, but I think there are enormous resources, and the greatest resources for understanding our essential finitude and temporality in the in the early work. So. So I have a very impious relation to Heidegger too, and to fully adjudicate that relation would require a different forum. And and I do acknowledge that footnotes has been very important uh, for the book, uh, but uh, 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 you know I wanted the hear heroes to be Marx and Hegel, but what I'm able to do with them is indebted to what I've been doing with Heidegger. So. Um, and we're going to move off some moment, but since we were talking about DSA a few minutes yeah, ago. Yeah. Um, I was just curious, while you were writing or thinking, like, how do you think about the political valence of the kind of atheism or secularism you're talking about in relation to the past two decades of kind of, you know, radical atheism, which is the office, mm -hmm. like Sam Harris, more contemporary, contemporarily, yeah. who I see as being sort of all centrist kind of liberal even a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's I'm curious. I mean, one thing that I've been really struck by is that. I actually, in the book, I never use the term atheism, and I never use the term secularism, actually. Uh, and somehow, but people just read those terms into it, but it was very important for me that I don't use either of those terms. Uh, a, because like atheism is primarily uh, defined negatively, yeah. as though, you know, this subtractive view, this is what you get when you take away religion, whereas like, I try to articulate a different foundation. Uh, and it's also not about secularism, you know, which is really about uh, political questions about the separation of church and state, the role of religion in public life, these sorts of issues. That, like, whereas my intervention is situated on a uh, different level uh, and trying to give an account of like what an emancipated secular life would look like and why that is demanded for the sort of political emancipation to which we should be committed. Uh, but that's not at all equivalent to a commitment to all the politics that goes on the name right, of secularism. Right. Uh, and, and, it's, and, and it's also not the same thing as saying that, like, well, all these people uh, need first to get over their, their religious beliefs and then mm -hmm. get to politics. It's, it, that's also why the King and Civil Rights Movement is so important in conclusion, trying to give an account of, like, you know, uh, the way, for example, uh, religious congregational practices are transformed in the labor movement in many of the same spaces. You know, I don't see that as a uh, secularization of the religious. I see it as a making explicit of the secular heart already of the religious practices. You know, that's also very another strategy of the book is that, like, uh, uh, when it comes to these terms of like faith and other, it's not that like I think that that's an originally secular religious notion that we need to secularize. I think it's an originally secular structure that's been, you know. Religionized, that's not what you would say. But uh, uh, so that puts a very different perspective on, and that allows you to have a very different understanding of the emancipatory potentials of these religious practices. Yeah, and, and I was almost asking like a strategic question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you see yeah. this as a way that you can, with lots of this, this life, and yeah. this, if you don't want to call yeah. it, you know, with not atheism or secularism, is there a way that that can offer an alternative to both of these sort of other? Yeah, I mean, part of the part of the part of the point of that is the. Is the very notion of secular faith actually, you know, which uh, that that's that's and uh, I've been a little distressed again that like these atheism secularism tags immediately are placed on it when 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 it, perf it performs something very different. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. But it's great. I mean, like it's, it's that's that's. Uh, yeah, but well, let's just take one more one final question if there is. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking a lot about uh, you know, this uh, uh, this poem by Philip Larkin, Church Going, you know, where he sort of goes to a church and sort of imagines what, uh, 
what, a, in a some sense, a, a secular version of the future would would think of that space. And I'm wondering, what do you do? What do we do with the religious past, as it were? Right. I mean, we could think of the material past, the artistic past, the, the books, the, the the history itself, which is makes us who we are, uh, in, in culturally at least, in in so many important ways. Yeah. Uh, what would you, I mean, what do you sort of, or what's your attitude towards that past, I suppose, if that's the right question? I mean, should we, do we imagine still sort of going to those spaces, those sanctuaries, various faiths, right? Um, but just sort of looking at them as Larkin does, or do we teach, do we still teach the Bible, but only as literature? I mean, how do you, yeah, sort of, I'm wondering how you think about those questions. Yeah, I mean, first of all, so I'm a Hegelian, so that means that I think that all, uh, human social practices are attempts of us, of spirit, of trying to understand ourselves and our own freedom, and that like progress has to do with the increasing realization of self-consciousness, that like actually like, you know, uh, so I said, you know, that like, uh, that's what we call God, for example, is a name for the uh, norms to which we hold ourselves, and we can come to recognize that we are the source of the authority of those norms, that we are answerable to one another rather than to something beyond us. Uh, and, you know, uh, if that's your perspective, then all cultural material are resources for understanding that narrative and that uh, struggle with ourselves. Uh, so, uh, and with that perspective, you, 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 can, you can, and part of what I do in the book is if you don't reduce the Bible to literature, but you don't uh, also think it's testimony to something divine beyond us, but it's like, it's genuine, uh, <laughs> a genuine form of collective, existential, social ways of trying to make sense of who we are and how we should be accountable to one another. Uh, and, 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 and the gradual, which is not linear, but, 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 but the, 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 the commitment to an increasing actualization of our freedom has to do with coming to recognize that. Great place to end. Thank you very much.